can have a seat if you will. Well, there has been an expectation all morning that God is going to move in this place. We're continuing our series that we're calling Colors of Hope. And this is based off my new book that just came out last week called Colors of Hope. The book is actually about the seven miracles of Jesus, seven very important miracles of Jesus in the Gospels that I believe teach us so much. But we decided that over this series, we want to just kind of continue the theme of the book. And by the way, if you didn't get a chance to pick up the book last week, I will be available out in the foyer. The book is available at the Resource Center anytime that you go there. But I know we had a lot of people still on spring break last week, and a lot of people weren't able to be here. And I would love to be able to sign your copy of the book because, honestly, that devalues the book by just a few cents. But I would be willing, I'd be willing to, to do that for you. And maybe one day, maybe one day, it'll sell more on eBay because of that signature. Who knows? But we're looking at a principle that is in this book that I believe is a principle that is pulled right out of the miracles of Jesus and is pulled right out of Scripture, and that is that God is a God of miracles. And I believe, honestly, we have to say, to really proclaim it, that God is still a God of miracles. Because I believe that most of you that are here, there's some of you maybe that are still on the outside looking in, that are still going, I don't know if I know about this, this God thing. I don't know if I know about Jesus and all this stuff, but I want to check it out. And if that's you, by the way, you're so brave. You're so courageous to step into this atmosphere and to be someone who's just checking that out. And so thank you for being here. But I think for a large majority of us, we believe that God is a God of miracles in the Bible that God is a God of miracles in the past. But we oftentimes miss the fact that God is a God of miracles today. Like that he's a God of the miracle that you brought in here. I believe that every single person that is in this room has a miracle. And we discount what a miracle is because we're so used to thinking that we bring things into our life. We blame ourselves when, or we, we celebrate ourselves when good things come into our lives, which also means we have to blame ourselves when bad things come into our lives often. And so we're so used to the natural that we can kind of miss the supernatural. And so what we want to do over this series is really just look at the fact that God is still wanting to do a miracle in you. Maybe it's a small miracle that he needs to work something out in your life. Maybe it's a miracle you've been praying for for a long time and it would take a moving of God. Or maybe for you, it's, it's the last resort. Like you need God to show up and to show off in your life because there's some, some major things that need to be accomplished through his presence. And I believe that as we study the miracles of the Bible, they are a sign pointing us to where the principles of how miracles come into our lives. And they're a sign pointing us towards gathering our own miracles. And so God is a God of miracles. And I hope you expect for him to do something in your life today. I hope you're on a, a journey towards where he wants you to be. And I want us to look at, again, the book of Kings. We're going to be in 2 Kings this week. We were in 1 Kings last week. We're going to jump over to 2 Kings this week, chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. 2 Kings, chapter 2. Verses 19 through 22, the scripture will be on your side screens if you don't have the Bible right in front of you or don't have your app up. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. It says, one day the leaders of the town of Jericho visited Elisha. Elisha. Now remember last week we looked at a miracle in the book of 1 Kings. And we looked at a miracle from this man named Elijah. Say, Ja. But this week we're going to study a little bit of Elisha. And, and I have to tell you, I just want to be honest. I'm always an honest pastor. I hope that you're able to kind of journey with God better because I share with you some of my difficulties along the way and share with you some of the things I struggle with. But I have to be honest. There was the first few years of following after Jesus, I didn't know that these were two different guys. Like I just thought when people talked about them, Elijah, Elisha, they were just mixing up things. I, mean, I, I get words wrong sometimes. I figured they didn't know how to pronounce them. And then one day I kind of figured out there were two guys. And so I went and had to read a little bit more in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. Because let's, let's just be honest, those aren't the first two books of the Bible you usually go and read when you get excited about God. And so I went and tracked down 1 Kings and 2 Kings. Probably didn't even know they were two 
two of those actually, and then went and found that there is an Elisha and an Elijah. And so I figured out that these guys are like the ultimate tag team, Old Testament tag team prophets. And in fact, this week we're going to see Elisha get the tag and he's going to come into the match as the prophet to come in and fight for the presence of God to be in front of the people so that they can have the faith to see a miracle right before their eyes. And that's what the presence of God was brought in by the prophet. Now we have access to the presence of God, not through a prophet or preacher, but through the Holy Spirit who is here with us right now. But the presence of God was brought in by Elisha. And at this point in the story, where we find him, he is barely getting his feet wet as a prophet. He's, he's barely, he doesn't, doesn't even know what's going on. But the thing with Elisha that we have different than Elijah is we actually know a little bit more about Elisha. Remember last week with Elijah, it was like he was boom, right on the scene. We didn't know where he came from. We didn't know what was going on. But Elisha, we get to know a little bit more of his story. And I think that that will help us if we know a little bit of his story to set up why God was able to usher in miracles on his behalf for others and through him and for him. And so let's kind of look at that. Elijah has just gone up to heaven. And by the way, Elijah didn't even die. Like he just went like Star Trek, Scotty beamed me up, boom, teleported right to heaven. No sickness, no illness, just boom, he's gone. Can somebody say hashtag life goals? Like that would be be awesome. Like, did not have to go through what we have to go through with death, and, and, and Elijah just, just goes up and, and he's there. But now Elisha is brought kind of to the front of the scene, to the forefront, because Elijah has gone to heaven, and he is brand new, and, and he is still green, but we see something is that he is trained, he's been trained, because he has been prepared. And so I, I think that this teaches us a little bit about the nature of God. We, when God wants you, when God has a purpose for you, when he has something that he really wants you to go and do, when he wants you to be a part of a miracle, when he is pushing you out into the to front lines of the miracle and to bring and usher in the presence of God into people's lives, what we can see through Elisha is that he has prepared you for what he has for you. In fact, if God has pushed you out there, if God's got, got you out there, it, you may think that you're not ready yet. But God is showing us that you are indeed ready because if God, what God has purposed you for, he has already prepared you for. Like he's already done the work in your life to prepare you for everything that you need to do what God wants to do in your life. So you may feel too young. That may be you. You may be like, I'm just, I'm just too young. There's no way God can really work through me and I've got too much to learn. I didn't know till just now. You may be saying that there was an Elisha and an Elijah or a first and second king. So I'm just, I'm just too young, you might say. You might say, man, you just don't, you don't know me. My, my past is just too much. Like I just took it too far. Um, I, I know God has forgiven me, but I don't think God's going to be using me. I don't, I don't think he is, is going to be using me in that way. And, and whatever your excuse is, I could name excuse after excuse after excuse, and I may not hit yours. But all of us at some, some deep corridor of our soul, we have this excuse that says why we can't be used the way that God. We have this excuse that says we're not ready. We're just not ready. But can I just tell you that the scripture here is telling you that you're already? Because it's telling us that God is already. So, so if God is already, already, like he's already, already. In fact, say that to yourself. Say, I am already, already. Like, I'm ready. Like, I've got everything that I need. Why? Not because you're anything. We, we're nothing. Like, we don't have it together. You don't have it together. You barely got here on time this morning, much less ushering in the presence of God and a miracle. Like, like, I'm not saying you're already. I'm saying the God whom you serve and who is preparing you has always been already. He's always been on time. And he is here. And so he's got a purpose for you, and you are already all ready. Let me, let me show you. Where this comes from in the story of Elisha. Look back, if you will, just a few pages back in Scripture, but a whole book. 1 Kings 19, verse 19 is where Elijah tags Elisha and is like, all right, all right, this is, this is yours now. 
You, you've got to usher in the presence of God. This is for you now. And so it says in verse 19 of 1 Kings chapter 19, so Elijah, that's the older guy, went out and found Elisha. Now, I, I just really, I don't understand this altogether because one time I had some friends um, and when I first met them, I found out, he introduced himself to me and he said that his name is Terry. And I said, great, that is awesome. He, he actually served on a team with me at Seacoast Church. And so I was like, man, it's great to meet you, Terry. You're awesome. Can I meet your, can I meet your wife? Yeah, yeah, she's right over here. Here she is. And she said, hello, my name is Terry. Was like, Wait a minute. What did you say your name was? Terry. Your name? Terry. All right. With an I? No, with a Y. With a Y too? With a Y too. So you got the same name. So that's cool. They're great people. They're awesome. They're unbelievable. They named both of their daughters Terry. No, they didn't. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> but they're, they're great. They're awesome. They're good people. But I'm just thinking, they meet each other. I don't know. Was it at church? Was it a Tuesday at the club? I don't know. I don't know when it was. But they met each other. They met each other, right? And, and so they're there, and they walk up, and, and, sh and he is attracted to her. And so he says, I'm going to go find out who this woman is. And he says, hello, my name is Terry. What's your name? She says, my name is Terry. I think at that point, probably I go, oh, it's good to meet you. That's very good. Because <laughs> I don't know how you date somebody that's got the same name. It's just confusing. But we call him Mr. We called him Mr. and they are the best people in the world. But I just don't know why Elijah didn't go, God, it's going to be confusing to people one day. If, we go, if I go find Elisha, can I, can I go find an Abendagago a, a or a Subago or a Dorito? Can I go find somebody that's got just a little bit different name? Because this is, this is confusing for me, honestly. And I know these people can handle it. But anyway, his name is Elisha. So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, and listen to this, plowing. He's plowing. Everybody say plowing. Plowing, because I want you to get that. Plowing is a great indicator of your future harvest. No plow, no harvest. Like if, you, if you don't take the time to break up the ground... The, the sometimes very hardened ground, the, the sometimes not ready to produce anything. If you don't take the time to plow, there never will be fruit. And so I've said this before, but I, I do it all the time. I get discouraged at God for the fruit that is not growing on the tree that is not there because I never planted the seed and I never planted the seed because I wasn't willing to do the work to plow. And so sometimes you got to plow, right? I mean, you got to plow to be the husband you want to be. There are so many times in my life where I go, I'm not where I want to be. I'm not the husband I want to be. I'm not the dad that I want to be. I'm not where I want to be. And you've got to plow to be able to be who it is that God wants you to be. Because I told you several weeks ago, there is a seed already inside of us that God says it's a small seed. It's not much there. But if you'll offer it to me, it's big enough to move mountains. Like you have got it in you to do whatever God is calling you to do, but if you never plant the seed or if you throw the seed on the hardened ground and don't take time to plow the seed, you'll never be who God wants you to do. So, so you get to a place in life and you're like, I don't know. I don't know why nothing's growing. I, I don't know why, why there's not anything there. There's no fruit in my marriage. I, I don't know why she, they don't respect me at work. I don't know why they don't think I'm a hard worker. Have you plowed? Have you plowed the ground? Elijah is there. Elisha is there rather. And he is Plowing, plowing. I think about my staff. You know what impressed me about Jonna Eiler? I mean, she's up here. There is power. Like she's getting it, right? That, that's, uh, we, you can find talent. You can always find talent, but you can't always find grit. And what impressed me about Jonna is that when she started singing for us, and like everybody does, she just started singing kind of in the background. And we knew she had it. Like her audition, we were like, what? She's got it. She's got it. But she was in the background. And then and just singing in the background, she started showing up beforehand to set up chairs over at Whitesville Elementary. And she started setting, helping set up chairs and setting up the stage. And then she was staying late. And then she was showing up to practice every Thursday night like our band does. And they put in hours and hours. And she was obviously practicing before she came in. And so she was working. She was plowing before she was ever paid to be here. See, before she was on staff here, she was plowing out in the field 
field saying, I've got I to gotta work this. I've got to get better. I'm going to work hard because I believe in the vision and the mission of this church. And so she was plowing. And so when we went to go hire somebody to do some work, we said, how about her? Because she's been plowing already. She's already been working. You know what impressed me? about my assistant Megan is that my wife Connie came home and she said, hey, she's plowing dirt. Like, like hard soil in a new ministry we're calling sisterhood and she's plowing stuff and she's showing up early and she's staying late and she's working and she's doing ministry and she's plowing before she was paid. See, there are lots of people that do things for you when you will pay them to do them for you. But there's other people who plow and they're working hard before they're ever paid. And so she was out there working and plowing. You, you know why Alex Postajnik gets to lead our student ministry? Alex, we had 127 people, I think Wednesday night, or not people, wait a minute. We had 127 students, 150 something or 30, 60 something people Wednesday night. The other day I was talking with a pastor about that and telling that our youth ministry is just, it's amazing. It's blowing up. If your students aren't there, uh, you need to get them there. If you're like, man, my, my student just won't go, can I just tell you, you are still the mama and you are still the daddy. So they can go if you, you yeah, they will go, right? They will go. Anyway, that's a whole nother sermon. And so, like, like you, you need to get them there because I promise you once you get them there, they'll be going, I want to go back. Like, I want to go back because God's showing up and it's amazing. But I was talking to another pastor about that the other day and he said, man, what is going on? I'm seeing the stuff on Instagram. I'm seeing the post about your church, but your youth ministry, what is happening? And I was like, oh, man, it's, it's our leadership. I was like, we've got an incredible, incredible leader. And they are like, oh, man, so, so was it hiring? Like, was it adding a full-time person? Was that what did it? And I was like. He's not full time. I was like, he still goes to school most of the time, works at a hotel some of the other time, and pay, we pay him to be here a few hours, but he's here a lot more hours because he's got grit, because he's willing to work. He's out with the plow going, I'm going to plow up some ground. I'm going to plow up some dirt in the life. You, you know why Matt still is our newest hire to, to our church. You know, you know why Matt is here? And I think the mayor might be with us. You, you know why we cordially went and asked that we could steal Matt from the town? So sorry about that, by the way. And so, you know, you know why we did that? It's because he was here spraying sidewalks and he had waders on and he was out cutting bushes out here in, in the, the ditch out here that they call a detention pond. He was out there cutting stuff and there where the snakes are. And I know Matthew says we're supposed to handle snakes, but I ain't handling no snake except with a shovel. And so, like, he's out there doing that. He's spraying the cleaning. He's doing ministry. He's leading ushers and he's plowing. He's plowing. Before he was paid, before we talked about being paid, he was here plowing over and over and over again. He had grit. He was willing to plow. Do you know why all of these lights up here, they move around and they do all the stuff that they do? And by the way, we love to, we think that the, in the presence of God, we should present our worship as art and so everything we do to, to kind of usher in the presence of God and people will say, oh, no, I don't understand why, why you need all them lights. Does God need all them lights? Have you ever read how God instructed to build Solomon's temple that there was 200 pomegranates carved on the top of the, these co columns that nobody would see? And there was these ornate bowls and ornate fixtures all throughout because God loves art. He loves when you make art out of your life, by the way. He loves the masterpiece that you can become when you will allow him to paint on a canvas canvas of pain with colors of hope. He loves that. And, and so we present it with art. We, we, everything we do, we want it to be an experience. We say we have worship experiences, not worship services. Funerals are services. We have worship experiences where the living is here and life is coming up into people's lives. And so anyway, do, do you know how all of this stuff works? Is it takes probably 30 to 40 hours a week to program machines back there that do things I don't even know how they do them and to plug the right ones into the right chords and move them around and to position them where singers are going to be and to hit at just the right, have you ever noticed they hit at just the right beat and they, they hit the beat and then they blow up and then there's fog up here and everything that happens has to be programmed in and it goes right along with the songs that we're doing and just ushers in the presence of God. Do you know how we do that? With 30 to 40 hours of work every single week and you know what we do? don't do, we don't pay someone 30 to 40 hours a week to do that. That's because Brandon White, who's back there, plows. He's plowing. We plow. He said, hey, well, I told him one time, I told him one time, you should go get another job. We can't pay you enough. He said, that's all right. I'll be okay. God will provide. I'm going to show up 40 hours a week until you pay me for 40 hours a week. 
I thought he would go away. He hadn't gone away. He keeps showing up because he's plowing. I thought he would get discouraged. He hasn't gotten discouraged because he's plowing. Because you know what? He knows that if I don't break up this ground, then there won't be anything there to plant. And if there's nothing where I can plant, there won't be anything that will grow. And if nothing will grow, I won't have any fruit. And if you want some fruit one day in your life, we call a miracle, you got to be plowing now. So Elijah went and he found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing. And yes, I do stop on one word like that sometimes and preach for 15 minutes. Especially if you help me out like you were. A field. He's plowing a field. And there were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. Always be willing to get in and get gritty with your team. Always be willing to get, get, get in and get gritty with your, just get, be a part of the action with any team that you're leading or any team that you're a part of. And he's there. And Elijah went over to him, and he throws his cloak on him across his shoulders, and then he walked away. This is, by the way, the Old Testament prophet version of, Dropping the mic. That's what he was doing. He's just like, I'm putting my cloak on you. I don't need to say anything else. Because what this said is, I have chosen you. And you are going to be trained by me. God would have it be that way. If you'll follow me, all is yours. Elijah's walking away thinking, come on, don't let this guy do it. Because I don't want to have an Elisha and an Elijah. But Elisha does different. And so he's there. He throws it and he walks away. He's at the plow. He's plowing dirt. He's working hard. Elisha is. Can I tell you that sometimes the class does not look like the calling. Like sometimes what you're going through is the class for your calling and you get confused because it doesn't look like what you want to do. But God, I want to lead big teams. Would you just plow and show up and pray over chairs and just do it when nobody can see you? But God, I want to do something great for you. Would you just sit down one-on-one -on -one with somebody and study the Bible with them and it doesn't get any press or publicity and nobody knows it's happening, but I'm preparing you in this process for something one day and I'm showing you what I can do through you. But God, no, I don't even know what to do next. Would you just show up and be obedient and plow where I've told you to plow, dig in deep to your heart where you need to do some work in your own self before I can do anything else with you. The class does not always look like the calling. You see, preparation is often hard to see. In fact, sometimes I think Elijah was probably like, am I, am I seeing things? Elijah's going, I got to, this guy just come up and put a cloak, that's the man of God. He's going to put a cloak on me. But I'm, I'm in, I'm in out in the manure in the mud. I'm, I'm out here plowing. What, I don't look, that doesn't look like training for a prophet. That doesn't look like training for a preacher. He's not preaching. He's just plowing. Do you know that sometimes your plowing is your greatest preaching, by the way? Like he's, he's just preaching. He's preaching as he's plowing. And so he's plowing. Do you think that Elijah, God says, go and find this man, Elisha, and he's going to be who you need to put the cloak on. And I'm prompting you in God's thing. I mean, Elijah's thinking, I'm going to show up to the temple. I'm going to show up and there's going to be a superstar preacher. I'm going to show up and there's gonna, he's going to already be leading his town. I'm going to show up and he's going to be ready to go. And he shows up and he's like, God, where, where are you at? Where, he's right over there. See the 12 teams? See the 12 teams? He's in one of those teams. What do you, wait a minute. He's leading it. So he's over here supervising. He look, he, he's over, no, no, no. He's, he's in there plowing. He's got dirt. He's the one that a lot of dirt on his feet. He's the one with a lot of dirt on his hands because he's, he's getting in the grind. He, he's, he's getting in the grit. And so he, he, that's him. And he, he, did, he said, am I seeing things? Do, do you know that when you look at yourself and you don't see the potential that is there to carry out the purpose that God has for you, that sometimes you feel like, am I seeing things? I mean, every time, every single time. I stand right over here in this corner and glance out at four services filling up at this church. I go, God, are you seeing things? Because surely you, didn't, you don't think I can lead this. God, God are you seeing things? Because surely you don't, th you don't think this is me. And for you in your life, there may be something, a miracle that God has called you to usher in. And you may be thinking, am I seeing things? Am I seeing things? In fact, that's my sermon title this weekend is, am I seeing things? Because sometimes there's something that God wants you to see. That you can't see, it's in the heavenlies and he's got to give you a picture of it. Sometimes what you can see is not exactly what's there because God's got other plans. And can I tell you that preparation is very difficult to see sometimes? Preparation looks a lot like in your life and maybe in this season of preparation you're going through this. But preparation can look a lot like offense. 
Do you know that every time you are offended, it is God preparing you to be someone who doesn't get offended? Like you're, every time that you had the opportunity to take offense, that God is going, will you plow up a little bit deeper? Will you go just a little bit, there's some hard clay still on that heart. Will you just plow in just a little bit more there? Because every time you get offended, you're like, what do you mean? Every time I get offended, I get offended. Like I'm offended right now, you might say. I'm offended at them, I'm offended at them, and I'm offended at them. Can I tell you, the only classes I ever had to retake in school were the ones I failed. And so if you're someone who walks around getting offended all the time, the class doesn't look like the calling. God has called you to be a person of no offense. And so you just need to, you need to learn to, to plow in deep. It's preparation for what's to come. God says you can't even handle what would come to you if you're offended by that. Like you can't even handle what would come to you if you can't take those little words. You can't do it. Preparation also, often looks like offense. Do you know that every pain is preparation? Every pain teaches us to rely on God even more. Every pain that we have to plow through in our life. You're going through that pain not because God brought it. Listen, just a little theology real quick. God did not bring the pain into your life in the same way you can see in this story that God did not bring the opportunity to plow. Elisha wasn't supposed to be plowing. We were supposed to pick fruit off of every tree except for one and eat of it freely. Like we weren't supposed to do, we weren't supposed to have any hard work. Every day you get home, I mean, you're sore. You weren't supposed to have that. Elijah, he was getting home and he was sore. There was pain associated with his work. And the work was associated with sin. The ground was hard and not fertile naturally by itself without plowing it, planting a seed and letting it grow because of sin. But God didn't make the sin happen. But God used the pain in Elisha's life to be a preparation for him for the purpose and the calling that he had for his life. And I'm going to tell you right now, God is going to use the pain that you've gone through and are going through for preparation for the calling that he has for your life. So what if we could just see the plow as a part of the process? That we get to see the work as a part of the process. We, 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 we got to plow past the hard stuff to get to the holy stuff. We, we've got to plow past the hard parts of life to get to the hope because the hope is in the, it's deep soil. It's deep soil in our souls. And so and I love this. I love this. I mentioned it earlier. But before Elisha was able to participate in a miracle, he had to plow through the manure. Sometimes you're going to have to go through some stuff in your life. Okay? Sometimes there, there's, just, there's just some stuff you're going to have to work through to get down to the area where the seed will grow. And most of the time, can I tell you from my experience, most of the time it's not somebody else's stuff. It's yours. It's yours. It's not, it's, not somebody, it's not somebody else's fault. It's mine. Like, like I'm having to plow into some deep areas of my life but because of my mistakes and because of my disobedience. And you're going to be the same way where you go, i gotta, I got to get deeper. i got to get deeper. I, I can't just let that come out of me. I can't just let that be inside of me. I've got to get that out because God's got something he wants to do in me. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah. He got it. He got it. And he said to him, first, can you let me go kiss my father and my mother goodbye? And then I will go with you. In other words, hey, I'm, I'm ready to go. Let's just do this. And Elijah replied, go on back, but think about what I have done to you. So Elisha did go back. He did think. And he returned to his oxen. And after he gave thought to this opportunity, here's what he did. He slaughtered them. His livelihood. He slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. So he takes his, his oxen and he kills them. And then he's like, they're not dead enough. I want them to be dead, dead. And so he takes them and he puts them on a fire and he roasts them. And look at this. He took the plow and he broke it up and he used it as a fire to build a fire. He burned away his living, his past, everything. He said, it is gone. And then he passed around the meat to the townspeople so that they would eat it. They would eat it. And so he said, I want it all gone. And they ate all. And they all ate rather. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. So it was a move of obedience 
that was a burn the sh- the sails and the ships and leave it behind. Now, I'm, I'm, is a move a bold move of obedience? I want to say a bold move of obedience always ushers in God's next miracle for you. It's a bold move of obedience that Elijah does. Elisha does here, and so that's just the way he rolls. So we get back to the story. So we're back now, finally, to Second Kings, chapter two. Verse 19 through 22, where we started, and then we learned a little bit about Elisha. One day, the leaders of the town, this is after Elijah has gone to be to heaven, and he's there. One day, the leaders of the town of Jericho visited Elisha. We have a problem, my Lord, they told him. Don't you love it when people come to you and tell you, we have a problem. We have a problem. Don't you love it when your child will come to you and they're like, Mom, we got a problem. What is it? I got a, I got a history project due tomorrow, and it's 9 o'clock at night, and it's due tomorrow. And I just saw that we got to have three library books, actually from the library, not on the interwebs. We got to have library books. And, and I'm in trouble. We, we got a problem. We got a problem, Mom. When did you find out about this project? Three months ago. But we got a problem, Mom. We got a problem. Don't you know, somebody comes to you at work, they've created a mess, and then they come to you as the boss, and they go, we got a problem. We got a problem. Or don't you love it when your boss creates a big mess and then comes to you and says, we got a problem. We got a problem. We got a problem. They say, we have a problem, they told him. So Elijah here, though, what we see is getting the chance to be a part of someone else's mess. And God will often use someone else's mess to allow us to be able to be a part of a miracle. See, see, if all we ever do is pray for our opportunity to be a part of a miracle to us, then we're missing out because God is always wanting to be a miracle through us. Because when he's a miracle through us, he is to us and through us. And God is a proficient and productive God. And so he wants to work in you, but while he's working in you, he wants to work through you. So you're never too young. It's never too early in your walk. There's always someone who's slightly behind you. And so he says, I want you to be... A miracle in someone else's life. Our prayer life will tell us, by the way, how serious we are about being a part of someone else's miracle. How much do we pray selfishness, selfish prayers? How how often do we pray, God, let me be a miracle to someone else? And if you represent Christ, if if you've let people know I am a Christ follower, and you let people know, hey, I, I want you to, would you come to church with me? They will come to you with their problems. Now, it'll look different sometimes. Sometimes their problems will not look like they're coming to you with problems at all. Sometimes it will be them just kind of coming to you and asking you for prayer. Do you know that we have an obligation as people who follow after Jesus that when someone asks us to pray for them that we should pray for them? It's the ushering in of a miracle. And for so long I took that so flippantly. I would just, people would come and they would say, hey, would you pray for me on this? I'd be like, sure, man, I'll pray for you. I'll remember that. It's awesome. I'll pray for you. And then I would never think about it again. I didn't mean to not think about it again, you know, just like you wouldn't. But then life happens and things happen and I would forget about it. I wouldn't remember to pray for them. And so I started this practice in my own life. I'm like, hey, someone asked for prayer. I'm going to pray for them right then. Like right then. And so oftentimes if you ask me to pray or you say, hey, this is going on in my life and something's happening in my life, I'm going to go, hey, what's your, what's your, can I pray for you? And I'm going to pray for you right then. If there's some reason why I can't pray for you right then, I'm going to still pray for you right then. I'm just going to do it silently. And I'm going to go, all right, I'm going to pray for you. And then I'm going to pray just then, right then. Because we have an obligation as people who usher in the presence of God to pray for people. Do, when, when people share their needs, do you know they're not just sharing your needs to you, to, with you because they're trying to complain? That's not, they're not trying to complain. It's a call and a cry for help in their lives. Like they came to you because they think something intuitively about you says you have answers to this problem. Like you, you walk around saying Jesus has changed your life. And they're going, I really need a life change. And so they come to you with a complaint. Or maybe they come to you to brag about what they did this weekend. Or maybe they come to try to push you just a little bit on your Kind of push your buttons just to see if you'll get agitated. But what they're really saying is, hey, don't you say you have a better answer? Don't, don't you say that you've got something else that, that, that is works that you can do in my life? How about when people hurt you? Do you know that some of you may be someone's miracle by simply offering them the all too often never offered gift of forgiveness? And grace when it's not deserved. 
when it's not, there's no way that, that, you, that it should be an offense and you should be rejected, but you're able to forgive them even when they don't deserve it, even when they never said they were sorry, even when you think they might do it again, that when we offer them that to, to them, he say, I, I give this to you. And who do you need to forgive? They don't deserve it. They don't deserve it. But aren't you glad that God didn't have that same standard when we brought our sin to him and he said, I will be faithful and I will be just to forgive you and I will offer you grace every single time. So what if we just forgave somebody? What if the miracle for someone would be that someone finally looked at them and said, I forgive you. You hurt me, but I forgive you. You said something, that, but I forgive you. I'm not taking offense to it and, and I'm going to give you grace. So what is their problem? This town, they say, is located in pleasant surroundings. As you can see, they're like the HOA board or something. As you can see, pleasant surroundings. It's wonderful. You should come to our town. However, the water is bad and the land is unproductive. What you see is not always what you get. I know that you think that they've got it all together. But what you see is not always what you get. I know that you walked in here acting like you have it all together. But what you see is not what you get. I know that you look at your situation and you think, what, what are you saying God can do something in this? Am I seeing things? Because what I'm seeing looks different from what you're seeing. And sometimes God will show us a picture of something that is so much deeper and darker on the inside, looks so great on the outside, but sometimes it's the opposite, that it looks horrible on the outside, but God is already working on the inside because what you see is not what you always get. They said, we, we see pleasant surroundings. It's pleasant surroundings. But there's something unproductive about the water. There were families in Jericho who were hurting and needed hope. No matter how good the surroundings look, no matter how good the economy is, no matter how good it seems to be going in their family, no matter how much they smile, there, there's something inside of all of us that we're dealing with where we just need some hope. It's like the husband who has pretended for years that the words of his wife don't cut deep. And it's just the way we are. It's just the way we do life. But the land is unproductive and a miracle is needed. It's like the teenager who feels like all they're ever told is just behave, just, just act the part. And they wonder if anybody really even cares for them and loves them. Because the land is unproductive and a miracle is needed. It's the mom who walked in here today with a smile plastered on your face. But the truth is, is the abuse is killing you on the inside. And you'll look straight ahead even right now. You'll act like it's not happening because you don't want him to look at you and think you're trying to let somebody know. But the land is unproductive. The surroundings may seem pleasant, but don't always think just because the outside looks pleasant that the inside is not in need of a miracle. So Elisha said, bring me a new bowl. Put salt in it. And so they brought it to him. Can I just tell you that sometimes you're going to have to get some new things in your life to be able to see the miracle ushered in. That sometimes the same vehicle that has brought the mess will not be able to be the same miracle, uh, vehicle that brings the miracle. Like you're going to have to get some new habits. You're going to have to get some new friends. You're going to have to get some new structure to your life, some new rhythms to your life. You're going to have to try some different things. You might need to get a new identity in Christ. You, you might need to stop carrying around that offense and get a new attitude. You, you might need, there's a lot of things. You might need to get something new in your life. What Elijah knew is we can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. We keep going to this and getting water out of it. And when we feed it to our women, they're not having babies. They're having stillborn babies. And when we feed it to them, the people are getting sick and they're dying and when we put it over neath all of the land nothing's growing up and so we need to do something different so give me a new bowl some of you need to say give me a new start give me a new day give me something new I can work with give me so just something God just a little ounce of hope give me a, some new friends give me some new time management now I gotta try something different in my life God because this isn't working out for me so what if your miracle is waiting to be activated 
Salt activates, by the way. That's what it does. What if your miracle is waiting to be activated, but your current attitude, your current structure and systems, the current way you do life, it just can't carry the weight of your miracle. Like, like what, what if God's got something for you, so, but you're going to new, you need something new. You need a new vehicle. So the presence of God was always there. It just needed a new method to be presented in. And so the presence of God is here. In fact, if you have asked Jesus to save you, the Holy Spirit lives in you. The presence of God. You are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. You walk around with Him all the time at your avail. And He is ready for you. The presence of God was always there. It just needed a new method to be presented. Then look at this, verse 21. This is probably the most important part. Then he went out to the spring that supplied the town with water. He threw salt in it and he said, this is what the Lord says. I have purified this water. I will no longer cause death or infertility. And the water has remained pure ever since, just as Elisha said. He went to the source. Many of you have been praying for miracles to happen in your symptoms. Do you notice that Elisha did not go to the women and go, let's see what's wrong with these women. Why are they producing all of these stillborn children? Why are they not conceiving at all? He did not go to the land and go, let's see what's wrong with this land. Why is it, what's going on here? I don't know what's happening. He did not go to the trees and the bushes and go, why are they not producing the fruit that they are to pr produce? What is going on here? He went straight to the source. And see, for every single one of us, there, there's something in your life that you need a miracle in. And if you'll dig deep enough, you'll find that there is something inside of you that is the source of the unproductive land. That there's something inside of you that is the source of the death. That there's something inside of you that is the source of the anger, the source of the attitude, the source of the lack of joy. The, the source is there. And you keep praying, God, give me patience. And God is saying, I, I can't because you got to go to the source. And as Ezekiel says, that we would ask for the heartbeat of God. See, in my own life, I've found that I will often pray that God would give me a miracle of taking away my symptoms. God, help me not to be anxious. Take away my symptoms. God, help me not to speak out in anger to my children. Help me with the symptoms. God, help me to be a loving, better husband. Help me with the symptoms. God says, oh, no, I want to get to the source. Because if I can fix the source, I can give you the faith to walk forward in your purpose, knowing that I have prepared you. So God says, would you plow some? Would you work some and help me get to the source? Would you, would you be willing to be a part of someone else's miracle as well and sharing community? Would you let me bring something new to your life, something totally different that you've never done, had before? New way? Would you let me go after the source and not the symptoms? Will you allow God to get to the source of your life? God, we pray your Holy Spirit over this, all of us, God, that you would work in our lives, that you would begin the hard work of plowing up deep soil. That, God, that we would ask that you would bring a fresh wind, a new thing. God, you said in your scripture, I am doing it. I'm doing a new thing. And so God, would you do a new thing in our lives? Would you help us to respond? Would you help us to be made more like you? In Jesus' name.